Is it possible that the Seattle Seahawks offensive line just a few seasons ago considered the weak spot on the roster, their Achilles heel is now their strongest position group, or at least one of them? Well, one football analyst believes they are a top five to seven unit in the entire NFL. Sanjeet T, the football scout from YouTube, joins us to talk about offensive line play for the Seattle Seahawks individually and as a unit today on Seahawks Forever. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast, in-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now here's your host, Dan Viennes. Welcome back to the show, everybody. As we get closer to the regular season, the Seahawks' second preseason game coming up this week. That's the one where most of the starters play, and we'll get a little bit better idea about where some of those guys are and where some of the young guys fit into them. But today, as I said, we are going to talk offensive line. And for that, I welcome back Sanjit T to the program again. You loved him the first time, the football scout on YouTube, uh, one of my most viewed episodes of all time. Oh, wow. well, welcome back to the show. We'll see if we can top that this time. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me, man. I, I love coming on your channel and, and talking Seahawks football, man. So thank you. What you do and what I love uh, is, is you break down tape and you do it in a way that's uh, just really easy to listen to and understand. Um, and, uh, you know, you have like five bajillion followers or uh, subscribers on YouTube. So if any of you are watching and aren't familiar with Sanjeet's work, uh, check it out. It's There are a lot of people out there that break down tape, but some people uh, do it in a way that's that's hard to watch, hard to listen to, or it's just too lengthy. Um, I think you, you just hit the sweet spot, man, and I love your stuff. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And the thing that I really appreciate you as well, we talked about the last time you were on the show, is that you are not a member of the 12s you are not a seahawks faithful you are actually uh you you primarily cover the raiders that is your team uh and then you start branching out on your channel and looking at the entire league and in doing so you have really taken a liking and and i don't even know if liking is a strong enough word to a number of members if not all the members of the seahawks offensive line and this is a unit that just a couple of years ago was considered the Achilles heel of the Seahawks, the weak spot of the Seahawks, the thing that that kept Russell Wilson from being able to compete for more championships. The offensive line just didn't give us a chance. But now it has, they've devoted some resources to it and they've hit on some guys. Right. Now, would you say going into this season, it's one of the strongest position groups on the roster? Yeah, I, I would find it hard to believe now. The Seahawks are stacked, right? Across the board, they've done a really, really good job drafting. But I would say this is this offense line is a top five to seven unit. Um, I think, you know, last year they're pretty good as well, but their tackles were rookies. Mm -hmm. And even the right guard position and center position wasn't 100% set in stone. And I think they really addressed that this offseason. Um, I think really the only differences from last year to this year is going to be the center position, right? Yeah. Because I believe Phil Haynes is expected to start at right guard. I know they, they went out and got Anthony Bradford. But at the moment, if I'm correct, it would be Phil Haynes. It sure looks that way. Yeah, it, it a, a lot of people, a lot of us, expected that to be more of a battle at right guard with the rookie Bradford and Haynes. Um, Haynes has never really been a full time starter. He alternated with Gabe Jackson last yep. year, yep. Um, but it it from day one of camp, it appears that he is the guy, and that Bradford's not quite ready to, yet to make a push. So, and and Haynes is a guy that even though he's kind of been under the radar, he's been in and out of the lineup. He's battled some injuries early in his career. Let's well, actually, let me do this. I almost jumped the gun <laughs> because you mentioned Phil Haynes, but we have a plan. I want to stick to it. I want to start outside and work our way in because then when we get to the middle. We actually do have a bit of a battle still going on there. So let's start with those rookie tackles. You mentioned them right off the top. Uh, Charles Cross, number nine pick in the draft last year. Abe Lucas, third round pick uh, last year. So rare, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, a team to go with rookie tackles. Right. And I think it's one of the only time in NFL histories that, that both tackles have played the entire season. Uh, talk about them individually and then uh, as a unit, because those two are forever going to be linked. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's let's start with, with Lucas. Uh, to me, first of all, I call him Abraham Lucas because that's that's kind of how I scouted him as. But that I is know his legal him. name. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So uh, Abraham Lucas, to me, is the better of the two, at least based off of last year's tape. 
I think Abraham Lucas has the potential to be a top six, seven tackle by the end of this season. Mm -hmm. to, to me, when you put the tape on of certain guys, they just – certain guys that are – you know, when you watch, for example, Trent Williams or Tyron Smith in their all-time primes, they just know how to play tackle, right? They just know what they're doing. From every little part of the game, right, from pass pro technique, they got the strength to anchor down. They understand blocking angles, the mental process. Nothing's too fast for them. Um, and then they're able to just put it all together. And with Abraham Lucas, you see every single one of those things. Like there's nothing Lucas really struggles with, right, that's that's out there. And you can say this guy may not be good because he, you know, can't do X, Y, and Z, Yeah. right? To me, Abraham Lucas looks very, very, very impressive. And it's interesting that he ended up falling last season when he came out in the draft. You know, you would think that based off of his college tape, he would have been drafted higher. And I'm not even sure why the, the hype wasn't around him from college. And, not, you know, I won't lie to you guys. I didn't have him ranked as a you know, top four or five guy coming out last year. Right. I didn't have him ranked as that. And I, I don't really know why looking back at his tape, why he didn't get that same type of hype that other guys were getting. Um, even more so than that, Abraham Lucas knows how to win with his hands, specifically in pass pro and run blocking. And I'll give you guys an example. There was a play that I was watching in, in training camp, right? The training camp footage. Shout out to you for giving me the, the uh, footage of the mock game. Anytime. Uh, there was a play in which a guy had his hands to the inside and he was pushing him back a little bit. And what he did was he took his right hand and he lifted that hand up, right? And he broke the, the leverage that the defensive lineman had. And from there, he was able to anchor down and win. And it's such a small little part, but it's those small things that make a guy great over time. Mm -hmm. right? It's the small little things that go into it. Um, and even Charles Cross. I mean, I'm not saying Abraham Lucas is so much better than Charles Cross. And Cross has no way to be a top-tier tackle. He can develop into that as well. I mean, the guy looked really good last year as well. All right, Charles Cross looked good. Now, obviously, I think Abraham Lucas looked better and I think Charles Cross, as he develops this year, could also be a very, very good tackle in himself. Um, there's really no big flaws with Charles Cross either. I think when you look at a guy like Cross, for him, the big thing is just from a mental standpoint, the the speed has to slow down. He just has to figure out how to, you know, defensive line games happen, pick that up faster. A guy delay blitzes, pick that up faster. All right, just his reaction time needs to just speed up just a little bit. And the thing with reaction time is, Going from year one to year two, it all it 100% of the time with every offense lineman out there, the game slows down, right? It's just a natural thing that happens, right? So to me, these guys are going to be very, very good tackles. It's interesting that you talk about uh, no weaknesses, no flaws, especially in regards to Lucas, because one thing both these guys have in common, they both came from air raid offenses. In fact, they both played for Mike Leach because Leach went from Washington State University to Mississippi State and uh, so cross played in that same system and and the knock on both these guys was outstanding pass protectors have some work to do in the in the run game. Uh, in your breakdown of Lewis, um, I believe from the training camp footage the other day, uh, you mentioned that you thought he was the best run blocker on the Seahawks offensive line. So that was something that came natural to him. Yeah, I love Damian Lewis. You know, it's interesting because when he, uh, he came from LSU, uh, is he going into year three or is he going into year four? Damian Lewis is in, in his fourth year um, and uh, because it's his contract year. So Damian okay. Lewis, the third-round pick out of LSU. We're going to talk about these guards now. And, and what's interesting about the guards is some of these guys don't get talked about. You know, right. the, tackles, and, the tackles are the flashy position. They right. were the high draft picks. Um, the public perception of Lewis has been a little – I want to say sketchy over the last year or two. It's almost like he's the forgotten guy right. with uh, some of the attention that's been paid to the right guard battle. But Lewis is a guy that, that you've – the first time we talked, you talked about, don't forget about Damian Lewis. Everyone right. forgets about Damian Lewis. Tell us about Damian Lewis. Yeah, Damian Lewis is a, a star offensive lineman. To, to me, he was the best – offensive overall offensive lineman last year for the Seahawks wow. I love Abraham Lucas but I think uh, Lewis wow. is better. not not saying that I don't think Lucas will be better but that's that's kind of how high I regard a guy like Damian Lewis and, and here's the thing unless the Seahawks are ready to pay this guy they're going to lose him right I, mm -hmm. I find it hard to believe Damian Lewis is going to come back and say hey give me seven eight million dollars and, and I'll resign for that I find that hard to believe Damian Lewis is one of the best guards in the NFL and he does not get the credit that he deserves um, to me, 
the guy's strong. He's physical. He's tough. He's nasty. He wants to put people down into the dirt. And those, you know, that mindset, that that killer mindset, to me, sticks out with Lewis because it's not just the mindset; it's the fact that, like, from a technique standpoint, he's also very sound. Guys run games; he'll pick it up. Right? Mm-hmm. Nothing's too fast. The guy delay blitzes; he picks it up. Right? Uh, I think Damian Lewis, even this season, you're gonna if, if you pay attention to him, you're really gonna see this guy start to stick out. Right? I think this is the year where. That too, you know, last year he did this a lot where he would pull and he'd, he'd kick out. I think the Seahawks run a lot of power-based uh, things. You're going to see him pull, and if you really pay attention, he moves people, right? He makes contact, and he physically overpowers people. I think he's going to end up having a great season this year. And, and another thing to keep in mind, uh, during this first preseason game against the Vikings, mm-hmm. both Phil Haynes and Evan Brown ended up playing. Yeah. And the two tackles didn't play, and right. Damian Lewis didn't play. And there's a reason why Damian Lewis did not play, right? Obviously, the Seahawks already know what they have with him. If uh, It's interesting the way it lines up it, from what you say. You, you're talking – you're saying – I want to make sure I get this right – that that if he – if the Seahawks allow him to hit free agency this offseason, you think he's going to get one of those top-of-the-market deals. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think he's going to become like a top seven to eight paid guard. And keep in mind, right? The top four guards are all making like, you know, 18 to $21 million. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to get like 13 to 16 million. Right. And I'm, I'm not a contracts person, so I don't really know, but I, I expect him to be paid as a top seven or eight guard. It, it's going to be a fascinating case study to see what the Seahawks do this offseason with him then, if that's the case, because, you know, they, they know that they've got some time to work with, with those two guys on rookie contracts from last year uh, in Cross and Lucas, but they're going to have to make decisions on paying those guys two years from now, um, let alone what they want to do at right guard. Although at right guard, we have a little bit more uh, of a, of a depth situation. And, and I suppose this can apply to left guard too, because they have played Anthony Bradford, the fourth round pick out of LSU this year at both spots. We thought he was going to be strictly a right guard going into camp, but Phil Haynes has locked down that spot. As we said earlier that he, pretty much from day one of training camp has been the unquestioned starter there. And Haynes is a guy that when the Seahawks re-signed him on the one-year deal this year, uh, even with all the injuries he's battled and being a part-time player, that you you think he's a solid player there as well. Yeah, I think it was surprising that Phil Haynes and Gabe L- – let me state this. Going into the, the season – And you know right? Gabe Jackson well because he came from the – Right, Rams. and I was – I was on the Gabe Jackson hype train. I said, this guy needs to be the full-time starter. Why do they keep rotating with this Phil Haynes guy? But then I put the tape on and I realized our right, Phil Haynes may be better than Gabe Jackson, right? Mm-hmm. And they're a little bit different because Phil Haynes may not be as like, you know, brute strength as a guy like Gabe Jackson. But Phil Haynes, from a technical standpoint, is very, very good. He has really good technique. Um, you know, when I say this offense line is going to be a top five to seven unit, it's because of the fact that every single one of these guys are very good in their own right. I do think Damian Lewis is better than Phil Haynes, but that doesn't mean Phil Haynes isn't really, really good himself. All right, Phil Haynes definitely will start over Anthony Bradford. I have no doubt in my mind. Yeah. Um, and even more so than that, right, the first group that went out there against the Vikings, Phil Haynes was playing left guard. And I think the reason why you had him playing left guard was because – if Damian Lewis gets hurt, I think it would naturally make the most sense. Phil Haynes is a veteran. He's already played in the NFL. The speed's not going to be too fast. So from him going from right guard over to left guard, if Damian Lewis were to go down, it makes more sense to put him at that left guard and leave Anthony Bradford at right guard, which is his natural position from college coming into the NFL. Um, just leave him in that right guard, and, you know, especially as a rookie. So I, I think that's probably why he ended up playing left guard in, in that first game is really just giving him those reps because – he will do that. He'll make that transition over, right? Yeah. Um, but I do really, really like Phil Haynes as well as part of why I think this offense sounds to be really good. Uh, Lewis is dinged up a little bit too. In fact, I, I, I'm i not sure this week if he's back to practicing full speed, but I, they are being careful with some guys, and I think he's certainly one of those. And and um, I just – if I'm as encouraged of anything uh, by what you're saying, it's, it's how high you are on Lewis because as a rookie, started every game – on the right side and generally it was considered that he played well and then he was moved to the left side the next year and the consensus seemed to be that he didn't quite play as well so uh now my eyes are going to be focused pretty clearly on damian lewis as we head into the season talking about phil haynes before we get to the center position um 
have you seen enough reps from Anthony Bradford to kind of get an idea of what his learning curve is and maybe how far away he would be from contributing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I watched every single one of his reps. Uh, early on, I actually watched the game like a couple of days back when I did my uh, Olubutimi breakdown. I watched him as well. But yesterday and today, I spent time rewatching his his reps. Um, here's the thing. When Bradford first came onto the field, he missed a couple of blocks. Uh, there was a play where Ivan Pace Jr. blitzed. It was a play action. Um, Bradford blocked down, play action. Uh, Ivan Pace blitzed to his right. He just didn't see it, mm -hmm. right? And another play that kind of sticks out to me, a, a linebacker ran a stunt with the D tackle, and he was just a little slow to, to get there, right? He, he didn't pick his block up. And then you watch him and D tackle the end run stunts, and he picks it up perfectly fine. I almost think that because linebackers are a little bit faster than D tackles in the ends, they're a little bit faster, they can, they're a little bit more twitchy, they move a little bit better. I think right now with Bradford, his biggest learning curve will be him developing the, the speed portion of it, right? His, his mental clock needs to speed up just a little bit faster. He needs to get used to the game speed and really just go from the college speed to the NFL speed. Yeah. And once that happens, once that move happens, he's going to be a good football player in himself. Um, very physical, very strong. Uh, he wants to hurt people, right? And you can kind of see that on tape. Um, that stood play. out in his college tape for sure. Yeah, right. And, and there's plays even in this first game where you know he'll he'll take a guy. Uh, one play that sticks out. He took a D tackle, passed him off to Evan Brown, and he looked over to the right tackle, uh, uh, and he went towards that guy. And he wanted he hit him right. He wanted to put him down. He didn't put him down, but he still hit him. He still had that mindset to want to put people down. I don't know Damian Lewis does that already, right? I think in in the in the Seahawks training camp video that I did, there was a play, at least one play where Lewis did do that, right? He passed the guy off to the center. He looked over to the left tackle and he went and he smacked the guy and they put him down into the ground, right? So that mindset is is a unique mindset. Not every NFL player has, all right? Not every guard in the NFL has that mindset of wanting to hurt people, wanting to put people down. Bradford definitely shows that, right? Um when I saw him double teaming, climbing to linebackers, double teaming one guy, picking off the backside linebacker, he did a great job. There was even a screenplay where he got downfield and uh, did a pretty good job getting downfield. He looks good, right? He looks good. I think for him, it's just going to be that that speed factor yeah. for him, right? Uh, and we watched Kendall Randolph a little bit too. I don't know if you want to talk about the other rookie guard. Yeah, so that's a little curveball you threw at me right before we started recording is that you you really like the limited reps that you saw from him, uh, undrafted free agent out of Alabama, but we know that there are guys that don't get an opportunity to play at Alabama <laughs> that are still right, probably right. better than some players that get drafted. You played some tackle and guard at Bama, um, playing exclusively guard for the Seahawks. Uh, what did you see from him? Yeah, 14 snaps, so it's not a whole lot of snaps. But sometimes you only need to see like four snaps to like kind of get a feel if a guy understands things. Um, right away, you can tell this guy's smart and he understands body angles and positioning in the run game specifically. You know, a place to his right, he sets himself up, you know, to the right of that defensive lineman. He puts himself in the way of wherever the run is. And you saw that pretty much on every run play he was in the game. He has good grip strength. He does need to get stronger, it seems like. And you know, I, I would even say that there's a chance, and I know, you know, Randolph played at the end of the game, and um, Bradford was playing at the beginning of the game, and he probably, you know, Bradford probably played better competition, but I think there's a chance that Randolph may already have a faster mental clock, right? The processing <laughs> speed, he may be a little bit faster than Bradford already, yeah. right? Uh, obviously, not comparing the two. One was a third round pick. One, uh, Bradford was a third round pick, I believe. Yeah. Right? He was third round pick, and then one was a UDFA, right? So. He, can't really compare the two, but something tells me if, if Kendall Randolph ended up playing more at Alabama, he would have also been drafted. Hmm. All right. He's he definitely, definitely keep an eye on him. Right. I, I don't think the Seahawks are going to just let him go. I think he'll be on the practice squad for sure for developmental purposes. I'll keep that in mind when I do my practice squad projection. I'll tuck that little note away <laughs> before we get to the center position, which, which is going to be fun to talk about um, on the left side, uh, the tandem that played, pretty exclusively throughout most of the first half of the Seahawks uh, stone Forsyth, yep, and then uh, the backup uh, left tackle out of Florida. And then uh, a guy that stood out to me from the first game that I wasn't expecting to Greg Island playing yeah. left guard next to him. So you got a guy who's, I think Forsyth goes six, seven. 
Yeah. Island six eight. It was weird to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Island looked surprisingly good for me for a guy who's so long. Did you did you see enough from either one of those guys to get an idea of what the Seahawks depth might be? Because that has been a concern uh, among fans is the depth up there. Yeah, it's interesting. So Greg Island, uh, I hope I'm saying it right. I played, which would be a great name if he was a tackle, right? You know, it's spelled well, differently. <laughs> so he actually played left guard with the second group, yep. but he did move over to right tackle with the third group. Um, I think he's a better guard than he is a tackle. I think he's a little too slow to be a tackle. Um, but there was an interesting play that stuck out to me right away. So, he, as you said, he's six eight. A play from left guard, he pulled over to the right, and he yeah. took on Ivan Pace Jr., uh, the linebacker of the Vikings, who's on the smaller side size right so you have this six mm-hmm. eight guy taking on this like five ten five eleven linebacker all right and it just kind of looked funky to look at as one guy pulled and made contact with the other guy um but i do like island i do think he has a little bit of upside but to be honest i, I think one of the one of the things with certain guys and i think both stone uh for uh, how do you say his last name is it foresight for, foresight yep. mm-hmm. foresight 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 so the thing with him and I think Greg Island kind of falls in the same category is they're not very mobile and they're not very quick, mm-hmm. right? And I think, especially as a tackle, you have to be athletic. You have to be able to move, right? Because as a guard, it's different. You're playing in a tight space. But as a tackle, you're playing with a lot of, you know, a lot of room, right? Guys can run all the way around you. Guys can then on the next way run around you fake it, come back to the inside. So there's more you have to do as a tackle. And to me, I just don't know if if the, the former Florida tackle is a long-term option as a backup. Mm-hmm. I, I think the Seahawks would be better off getting a different type of tackle to, to come in and play. Now, I watch Jake Curran Cur- yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he may even be ahead of Stone. He may be a little bit further ahead of him in terms of, you know, they both struggled in pass pro. Noticed that right away. Both guys had losing reps and pass pro. The quarterback took a couple of hits. Um, and the thing is, is, you know, what what's an what's an acceptable level of how many times the guy loses a rep? Right. Because not every rep is going to translate into a sack or a quarterback hit, right? Because you have one step drops as a quarterback, you have three step drops as a yeah. quarterback. So the ball may be out before the the defensive end actually gets to the quarterback. So we may never think twice about that play, but at an individual level. When you're looking at these tackles taking on that defensive end, and if they're losing like six times in a game, that's too many losses, Yeah. right? Um, so I, I think from that perspective, to me, I'm not sold on any of these guys. And I know it's early. It's preseason week one. But, you know, if if you had to – if if Abraham Lucas went down and you had to rely on one of these guys, I would not feel comfortable, hmm. right? Uh, Nick Boza comes up and, and takes, you know, 50 <laughs> snaps against one. I would not feel comfortable with that. Why you got to put those images in my head? (laughs) Uh, Let's get into the center position because this is one that I think, you know, we know which way they're leaning, but I think it's enough up in the air. They haven't officially announced, you know, Pete has said Evan's leading the competition, but he always prefaces that by saying he's leading because of his experience. Um, and, And by all accounts, he's had a solid camp. And played really well at center two years ago when he got a chance to be a full-time starter there for uh, for the Lions because of an injury. Right. Um, but Olu Oluwatimi played exclusively, uh, played most of the second half. Joey Hunt came in later. Um, and most people seem to think that he played really well and that he is pushing Brown for that spot. You have said you like Brown, but you did a pretty extensive breakdown on Oluwatimi. You think he's a dude and it's just a matter of time before yep. he's the starter. Right. I wouldn't be surprised if it happened this year, um, but I do think it makes the most sense to let Evan Brown go in this season as a starter. And I say that because this this you know th- this Seahawks team isn't looking to get a top five pick. The Seahawks team has Super Bowl aspirations based off of the, the team, right? You look at some of the guys that, Dramont Jones looks really good. You look at some of the draft picks they've had, the investments they've made, um, you know, they brought back the quarterback, right? Yeah. They extended him. They went out and got another wide receiver who looks really, really good. And the offense line's a top five to seven unit. And I think right now, although I don't think if he stepped in day one, he could start and you wouldn't really notice that much of a drop off. I just think it makes more sense to let this guy 
for one whole season, just red shirt, get used to the speed of the game. Mm. If it naturally happens, if Evan Brown goes down, great, you have a, a capable center. But I think him redshirting for one season can't do harm for a guy, right? He'll, you know, because one of the things we have to consider is there's offensive line calls that come from the center. There's slides. There's things that they have to look for, keys and those type of things. And that's something we don't know, like how good he is, right? Is is he really good at that right now? Is he not? Uh, Evan Brown already has all that stuff down. He knows what to key in on. He knows what to look at. With Oluwatimi, he does have to learn those those little things. But he's been a center for a while. He can figure it out. Yeah. It's not like rocket science or anything, right, for a guy that's done this for a long time. I just feel like it would be best to leave Evan Brown as a starting center. Um, but if Oluwatimi did take over, I don't think there would be much of a drop-off at all, if any. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Now, also keep this in mind, right? Evan Brown has played against some of the best defensive linemen in the NFL and on planet earth, if you really want to think about it in that aspect. And the thing with Evan Brown is he's shown us that he can do it with Oluwatimi. He hasn't necessarily shown us that he can do it against the best, hmm. you know, Aaron Donald's the yeah. Javon Hargraves this year, right. Playing against the 49ers. Evan Brown has already shown us that he can do it. And I have a lot of confidence that he'll continue to be a successful center. And even in that first game, Evan Brown dominated in that Vikings game. Like he did not have any losing reps, um, was it like 14, 15 snaps? I believe him and uh, Phil Haynes played the same exact snaps and they came out at the same exact time. Hmm. They both look really, really good. Neither of them had losing reps in this Vikings preseason game, which they shouldn't have, right? Because I don't think the Vikings played any starters. But that's a great sign to kind of have, right? Olu Utimi did have like one or two losing reps, right? Okay. So just which you would expect of, from a rookie, yeah, absolutely, and you would expect that from a rookie. But for a rookie, he he looks very very good as well. Um, let me ask you this question: If you know when when week six comes around, who do you think will ultimately end up being the guy when week six is here? Will it be the rookie or will it be the veteran? I I I agree with you. I think it's Evan Brown's job to lose unless uh, unless he gets hurt. I, I think he's a capable enough center. I think this team wants to be patient enough with Olu um, and they see him as a long-term fix, which is such a luxury to have because the center position, as much as the offensive line as a whole has struggled uh, over most of the last seven or eight years, the center position has really, really been a tough one uh, where the starter just hasn't been good enough and has at times been a liability. And then the drop-off even from the starter to the backup has been really severe didn't have quality depth there so when austin Blythe was getting blasted because teams were focusing on interior pressure and that's really kind of what keyed geno smith not having as good a last third of the season last year teams just start picking on Blythe. well the backup wasn't any better either um and, and it's just a nice as a seahawk fan it's nice knowing we have two capable centers uh one of whom is young and, and can possibly be the guy long term so it's a whole different ball game but but it sounds like maybe they need to be looking for potentially someone else to be the backup tackle. We should see more of the starters this week against Dallas in the second preseason game uh, and, and see those, some of those combinations and see those guys playing together and how they look. Uh, we'll, we'll get more answers for sure out of the second preseason game. Sanjit, I really appreciate you coming back on and uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, tell people about your channel and what you've got coming on, some breakdowns you're, you're planning. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one of the guys I was actually thinking about breaking down today was, was Anthony Bradford. I was thinking about kind of getting into him, maybe analyzing his tape. I also thought about analyzing maybe a combination of Phil Haynes, Evan Brown, and Anthony Bradford just to kind right. of get it all into one video. Yeah. Um, you know, and of course, you know, I don't do just Seahawks film breakdowns, right? We'll, we'll cover yeah. the Bears. We'll cover uh, you know, we'll cover some of the other teams as well. But for the most part, you know, I, as the season kind of starts, I do plan to do at least a weekly video of the Seattle Seahawks. Maybe it's just an overall offensive line analysis. Maybe we'll get into some of the defensive linemen. Uh, to me, there's a couple guys that I really, really like that the Seahawks have. Uh, Jermont Jones, you know, as a Raider fan, I played against him for many, many, many years. And the guy's very, very solid. Derek Hall looked very explosive, mm -hmm. you know, in that first game. So, yeah, so football, the, the football scout is where you guys can find me. Um, last thing I want to state, uh, wild card, Jalen McKenzie as the third third tackle on, on the on the for the Seahawks. He's a guy to keep a, an eye on. Right. Ne never say never. 
I think he's a guy that could definitely have some upside. Okay. Another name to tuck away, Seahawk fans. Uh, that's going to do it for me this week. I will be back after the preseason game to give you my thoughts on what the team looked like in game two. Uh, and then moving forward into next week, we'll get ready for final 53-man roster projections, cuts, things of that nature. Lots to talk about over the next couple of weeks as we head into the regular season. Thank you again, Sanjeet. You can follow me on Twitter at Seahawks Forever. Until next time, forever and always, go Hawks. Mm-hmm.